Hi everyone. In this uh, final episode on the Meroxy bind, we're going to take a look at uh, the bind from Black's point of view and look at the ways that uh, Black can fight against it. Uh, well, first of all, sometimes Black just tries to avoid it. So let's look at that. Um, let's take a position from the Sicilian, well, the, the opening line of the Sicilian. e4, c5, knight f3, d6. This is uh, most main line of the Sicilians, although of course uh, knight c6, quite a respectable move and many other moves are possible there. But this is the, the ultimate main line of the Sicilian, most popular main line. Okay, pawn takes, d4, pawn takes, knight takes, and now black plays knight f6. And you've probably heard it said before that black is playing knight f6 to uh, induce knight to c3, the most common response, and then the Meroxy bind has been prevented. And that's certainly the case. And so if you can just avoid the Meroxy bind, you don't have to worry about it. Well, everything's fine, but you can't uh, always avoid it. In fact, there is a, uh, an alternative that's still played. And I looked it up and I found some Grandmaster games from uh, 2019 where this was being played. So um, this is still a playable line, even at the top levels. And that's the move F3. This is called the Prince variation. And um, so it's, it's uh, very simply defending that pawn by an alternate means so that the move c4 is still available and white is going to go for a Meroxy bind position in this situation. So um, I, I looked up some sample games and I found this nice one by uh, Bobby Fischer. Bobby Fischer has the black pieces here and William Lombardi has the white pieces. And this game was played in 1960 in the uh, USA Championship. So um, well, maybe I should explain a little bit why this move is not as popular as knight to c3. I mean, it's playable, but basically um, black with good play can equalize. And uh, there's a similar move here. Um, the bishop could come out and defend the pawn this way. That's another way to get to a Meroxy bind position. That's much less popular because uh, the bishop is maybe not so well placed there. The pawns on the light squares, it'll be blocked in for a while. So F3, the most popular way of uh, going for a Meroxy bind position, even when, um, even when uh, black is trying to prevent it. So you're, you're black and you have to play against this Meroxy bind. How do you proceed? And uh, well, in general, um, if you're looking for a model game, it's often a good idea to look at the games of Bobby Fischer because he has such a clear and direct style. So it's often pretty easy to uh, understand what's going on and uh, figure out how to apply it to your own game. So uh, let's take a look at how he played here. Now, the most popular response is actually um, e5, but the, the move he chose is uh, knight to c6. I think both of these are quite playable, good for, uh, or at least equal for black. Okay, so white goes c4, and now Bobby continues with e6. So this is his idea. He's just going to set up this pawn structure, and uh, when the time is right, He's going to push the D pawn forward to D5 and bust up the Meroxy bind. So this is just a kind of a direct uh, onslaught, a direct counterattack on the Meroxy bind structure. And this is one way to deal with it. And this also explains in, um, in many Sicilians, in the E6 Sicilians rather, um, white often has the opportunity to play a Meroxy bind and rarely does because if you think about it, if black has a pawn on e6 and he still hasn't moved the d-pawn, um, then after white sets up this Meroxy bind setup, um, black can often get in this move d5 to d7 to d5 in one go. And so can break that pawn structure up even more quickly. So uh, that seems to be uh, the reason why it's not so often played. So let's see how, how black plays with these pawns here. We see knight c3. That Typical, typical Meroxy move and um, bishop to e7. Both sides develop for a couple of moves here. Bishop e3, castles, and knight c2. So uh, Lombardi is playing in a style that uh, keeps all the pieces on. That's something you often want to do when you have the Meroxy bind. You have a little more space than your opponent and you just uh, Try to keep all the or as many pieces as you can on the board and try and prove that your opponent's setup is a bit cramped. And certainly black is all confined to the lower three rows at this point, to the first three rows. 
And a second point is that uh, with the knight out of the way, the queen and the other knight, the c3 knight, are both looking at the d5 square, uh, seemingly preventing the move uh, d5. So what does Bobby Fischer play? He plays d5 anyway. Now, I have to admit, uh, this is not a move I would find very easily. But uh, I checked this out with a chess engine, and this is an absolutely correct uh, pawn sacrifice. It thinks after this sacrifice that uh, black is uh, equal or better. So let's take a look at this and see if we can figure out why. So pawn takes. This was played. Um, it takes back with a pawn. Then knight takes. Fisher takes with a knight. And then queen takes. So he did get one pair of uh, pieces traded. And uh, also, he's not going to trade queens. He's going to move his queen to the side. So what does black have in exchange for that pawn? Well, first of all, white is not castled. And if white wants to castle to the king's side, there's a bishop in the way, so not going to castle very quickly. Um, and secondly, this uh, queen is a target. Like I said, Bobby Fischer is not going to trade queens here, but he's going to step aside with queen c7. And there's a lot of different ways that that queen can be uh, harassed. You can bring the rook here, and that would also prevent uh, black from castling queenside, or at least slow down that, that idea. There's also the bishop that can come out and harass the queen. So, um, you know, if you take a deeper look at this position, uh, you can start to see the justification for that uh, pawn sacrifice. And as I said, the, the chess engine validates this as a valid a valid move for black and good for black. Um, so in this position, um, Lombardi played queen b5 immediately, but just, just to show a couple of other ideas, could have played rook c1. These are all playable moves. And um, the response would be bishop to e6, kicking the queen this way. He could also have played um, bishop to e2. And notice that both of those moves prevent queenside castling, but bishop e2 at least is setting up kingside castling. And now uh, rook to d8 is the recommended response. But in both cases, um, black is gaining some tempos by chasing the queen. So um, Lombardi just uh, avoids all of that by uh, stepping aside with his queen, puts it on this square. And Bobby continues developing with an indirect threat on the queen that way. And now uh, Lombardi plays Rook to c1, a pretty natural move. But, uh, well, Bobby Fischer spots a tactic in this position. Uh, so uh, if you want to uh, think about this for a little while, this is, this is probably a pretty good exercise. I, I don't know. This is kind of a deep tactic. But, uh, yeah, worth hunting for. And then uh, pause the video if you want time to think about it. I'm going to uh, give the answer away now. Um, so the move here that Black played, that Bobby played, is knight to b4. And, uh, well, okay, it's a tempo move on the queen. And um, there is a threat on the knight here. But, uh, of course, the knight can just be taken. And then uh, Black's queen is under threat as well. And, in fact, uh, that's how it went. Knight takes b4. Queen takes c1 check. So the rook was defended there, but the queen needed to get out of trouble somehow. And um, let's look at this exchange. The queen is trading itself for a rook. Bishop takes rook. Bishop takes queen. And that was all correct. And then um, at the end of this, you had to notice that the knight was hanging, as well as the bishop is hanging. So white has a choice here of... Uh, saving saving the knight or taking the bishop and uh well lombardi played knight d5 saving the knight also counterattacking this bishop so um uh, um let's see bobby throws in um uh, bishop to h4 check g3 that that bishop here was going with check so he needed to move it out of the way then he takes here and uh, giving white a choice of which bishop to take, but white probably doesn't want to take this bishop and mess up the pawns. So king takes was played, and then now the bishop drops back to d8, where it um, acts as a restraint on that knight, prevents the knight from coming forward. Uh, so this is the position that uh, Bobby got from that tactic, and you see he's up the exchange. He has a rook 
two rooks and a bishop, and white has a rook, a bishop, a knight, and uh, and an extra pawn. So he still has that extra pawn he had from the beginning, but he's down the exchange now, and black is a little bit better. Um, just uh, look at the other way of playing that uh, in this position after bishop takes b5. Um, white could have played bishop takes b5 directly. Then, uh, then the knight goes with check, and the king has to move. Maybe the king comes up. Not Not a bad move. The king will come over. I mean, the king is getting out of the way of the rook, so the rook can get into the game. And, uh, well, once again, Bobby is up the exchange. But uh, in this case, white has the bishop pair. Still a slight advantage to black. So so black came out of that okay in any case. But anyway, let's go back to the game. Knight d5 was played. Bishop h4 check. g3. Bishop takes f1. King takes. Bishop back to d8. So... Uh, the game continues here. Let's see, bishop d2, rook to c8, bishop c3. So now uh, white is finally getting all his pieces into the game. And f5, just continuing to uh, undermine that uh, pawn structure. Also, the rook is opposite the king here. So taking the pawn, white would not be able to take back. Um, and Lombardi played pawn to e5. He could have played king g2, just getting out of the way. But after this exchange, say rook to e8, he's got this isolated pawn that he's going to have to worry about. And, uh, you know, if uh, also with all these open files, uh, the rooks will start to coordinate with the bishop. It might be hard for white to uh, defend that and uh, probably impossible for white to really advance it. So it's probably more of a weakness than a strength, even though it is a passed pawn. Anyway, Lombardi chose to play e5. Uh, rook to c5 was played. And let's let's just step through this a little faster place. We'll see some maneuvering here. Uh, Bobby is trading down now. With the knight stepped out of the way, but uh, he's going to use his pen to force some more exchanges and get to a pure two rooks versus rook and bishop type of position. A lot simpler and easier to deal with. King comes forward. The other king comes forward and uh, typical end game march to the center. Now the uh, the rook comes up and uh, and then uh, William Lombardi places his rook here and Bobby Fisher sees a way to simplify this to a winning end game. Another thing that maybe would not be obvious, but this is often the case that the way you win in one of these end games where you have the exchange, we have the advantage of the exchange, is you give it back. You give the exchange back, and uh, typically you get a pawn for it. And what can happen here, and does happen, is that uh, black goes for a pure rook and pawn end game. And you might think, oh, why has he done this? Isn't that even? But uh, while, the, while the material is even, actually, this is completely winning. And uh, what Bobby has spotted is that he can create an outside pass pawn. Also, is, is king. He has a better king position than white. So the combination of that is just going to be a win. Um, let's see. Yeah, he gets to move first. Black has to scramble here to uh, get over to defend the pawns. And then we can just watch the end game technique from here. He uh, first locks up the pawns on the king's side, and then he pushes on the queen's side, creating that outside passer. He uses the passed pawn to distract white's king away, and then with this, um, he's achieved a superior king position and is just uh, going to march over and take the pawns on the, uh, on the king's side. And so uh, Lombardi resigned in this position. So anyway, that's how you can fight against the, uh, the Meroxy. Uh, I want to show you another example where, uh, where black just uh, encourages white to set up a Meroxy. This next game was played between uh, Paul Keras with the white pieces and Tigran Petrosian with the black pieces in uh, 1959 at the Candidates Tournament. So Keras starts off with uh, e4, c5, knight of three, knight c6, d4, we see the typical exchange here, and g6. 
So G6, this is the Accelerated Dragon, and this is just uh, pretty much asking <laughs> asking White to set up a Meroxy Bind. So not only is uh, Black not afraid of the Meroxy Bind, uh, but Black is actually encouraging this. And this is a good position for White in general. It's not like uh, losing for Black or anything. But, um, but uh, Black has a very solid position here, so it's uh, difficult for White to break through, even though White is going to get a position where he has a little more space, as we talked about <clears throat> in the previous episodes. So bishop g7, bishop b3, we're going to get a very typical setup here, knight f6, knight uh, c3. So not attacking the pawn until after <laughs> the c-pawn has been pushed, so this knight can conveniently come out behind the c-pawn. And, uh, and now here's, uh, there's, a different, there's different ways for black to play this position. Uh, just castling here is a very common move. And um, d6, fairly common, just uh, restraining those pawns from coming forward. But uh, Petrosian plays in another way. This is also a main line. This is a popular move. It's the kind of funny move, knight to g4. But uh, it's, it's a tactical idea based on the uh, somewhat loose position of the knight here. So the line continues, queen takes knight, and uh, knight takes knight. And then there's actually nothing better for the queen to do than to retreat. It's going to be running into some tempo gaining moves from this pawn here. And white wants to force this knight away from that good central location. So actually the main line here is queen d1 and that is the best move. So like I say, this is a typical position. Uh, white continues to have that uh, opening edge. It's not like anything has gone wrong here. Uh, the purpose of this maneuver, let's see, let's drop the knight back. The purpose of this maneuver was, um, well, I don't know, maybe maybe white, maybe white, black likes to have the knight on e6. I haven't quite decided if that's a strength or a weakness, but it did uh, force an exchange of one pair of minor pieces. So it's uh, dealt with one of the problems, or started to deal with one of the problems of playing against the Meroxy, which is uh, you know, the space issue. So black is going to have uh, places for all of his minor pieces here. Let's see, uh, white continued queen d2, uh, rook c1 could also be played there. Black goes d6. And now um, as an alternative to d6, I just wanted to mention that uh, black can also play uh, queen to a5 here. Certainly another way to play this and a uh, way to activate the queen. Um, but doesn't the Petrosian doesn't play that way in this game. We'll see, he does uh, some different things with the queen. Uh, so d6, bishop to e2. Get this typical lineup of the bishops in the Meroxy bind. Bishop to d7, castles, castles. So seems like um, you know every every piece has a home here. Black is very harmonious, and uh, and White's position is as well. And in fact, um, maybe White could even consider pushing pushing the f pawn forward directly and, and going for an attack here. But um, well, rook h c1 is a nice preparatory move here. Bishop to c6 now. Some pressure is being applied to the center here. The other rook, Keres brings another rook to the center with rook f to d1 um, and knight to c5. So now there's two pieces attacking this pawn and uh, and uh, white has to do something about it f3. Yeah, so maybe when I mentioned f4 before, maybe that wasn't such a great idea because black with the knight on e6 has this maneuver to put more pressure on the center. So kind of force this typical structure, but but this is a typical Meroxy setup anyway. So uh, so White is still doing fine here. Um, you know, I did think about alternatives at this point too. For example, I was wondering, well, what if uh, White wants to uh, just trade off that knight, and um, you know, so he doesn't have to defend the uh, pawn, and then maybe move the queen away, like uh, queen g5, gaining a tempo by exposing the uh, rook attack on the queen. But it turns out that, uh, well, here's a, here's a good place for black to play that queen a5 move. And now um, black is concentrating on the knight. This uh, weakness here is not a problem because, uh, well, the rook will come over and then that pawn can be grabbed anyway. So all this seems to be fine for black. Um, and white is probably not going to give up the bishop pair unless white can see some kind of advantage. So not a good idea to trade there. 
Uh, so Karez played f3, and uh, Petrosian went with a5 here. So this is a move that helps secure the knight on this square. So, uh, you know, part of playing against the Meroxi bind is just making sure your pieces all have good squares. And uh, this is this is what uh, Petrosian is doing here. Uh, b3, then queen b6. This is a peculiar move and a bit hard to explain. Uh, and in fact, the queen doesn't stay there. It, it uh, maneuvers. In fact, uh, this is the beginning of a maneuvering phase of the game. So this is how you play against it, or one way to play against the Meroxi bind if you're not going to directly attack it, but you let white set it up. Um, you're just going to play some maneuvering moves with your pieces. You're not going to be rushing your pawns forward and trying to tear it apart, but you're, you're going to make sure all your pieces have good squares. They're all actively post, posted, and you're going to, to maneuver them around and see if you can catch your opponent off guard, catch his pieces in a bizarre configuration at some point that you can take advantage of, an unusual or off configuration. And um, well, white is going to do the same thing, actually. White is going to try and maneuver his pieces around, try and put pressure on black, and try and catch uh, black in a position where things are a bit awkward at some point or another. So to this end, uh, let's see. White's move. White plays knight to b5. Um, the move knight to d5 probably could have been played there. It might have just provoked an exchange, although maybe the bishop would have, I mean, the queen. The queen could have just gone back to d Eight and defended as well. Anyway, uh, Keres wasn't wasn't going for that. Was going with the knight over to b5, rook f to c8. So let's just um, move forward here. Oh, I, I put the wrong rook there. Sorry, rook f to c8. Let's just move forward a few moves and watch as uh, as uh, Petrosian moves his queen around. So the queen has come back, and now when White uh, moved his queen over here, when uh, Kerez moved his queen over there to look at this uh, knight. Well, uh, Petrosian did the same thing, lining up his queen with the bishop to look at that knight. So, you know, there could be some trades there, but uh, nothing is gained. So this knight drops back to c3. Uh, b6 is played, and now uh, that knight is very securely defended, so um, the bishop doesn't want to take there. Just uh, Black will just take back with a pawn. So rook to c2, preparing to double, and another queen maneuver. Well, maybe uh, maybe f5 is being thought about. f5 could be a good move to play at the right moment. There's always a little pressure on the knight, so this knight has to be kept defended. Um, so there are things going on in this position. It's just that uh, there's no immediate strike, and both sides are kind of maneuvering the pieces around. The queen here is also defending that e-pawn, so... Uh, uh, Petrosian is not worried about that at this moment. And uh, you notice this knight has went here, and then it went back, and then it went here. So this is the typical square the knight goes to on, for the Meroxi bind. It finds its way there eventually. And we get some more maneuvers. So piling up on the uh, e-pawn there. White is doing the right thing with all this poking and prodding. But uh, uh, as long as, uh, as black can efficiently uh, defend everything. Uh, nothing is going wrong for black either. Um, we get more pressure here, and finally f3 or f6 is provoked. Um, but I don't know if that was an advantage for... Uh, <laughs> is that Was that an accomplishment? The, the bishop has to retreat. Uh, I guess it is an accomplishment because now this bishop is blocked in. But, uh, well, it's certainly a, a central push becomes a thought. Although I, I guess you don't want to play this move. I take that back because uh, that would give give uh, white a lot of influence on the light squares if you play a move like that. More likely, this move is coming here. But um, anyway, let's continue. Oh yeah, e6 was played immediately. Kick the knight away, the knight goes back to c3. Rook to uh, d7, centralizing the rook. Bishop to d4, piling up on this uh, f-pawn here from the other side, and f5. So at this point, Finally, um, black has gotten in a break. So black has waited uh, what seems like <laughs> a long time with all of these maneuvering and decides this is the right time to go for a break and try and create some activity. And we are on move 30. You know, in a lot of these games, uh, 
these were played in the old time controls where you had like two hours, each side had two hours or a little more to uh, play the first 40 moves. So sometimes you see a flurry of activity uh, leading up to move 40 as, as both sides try to uh, catch out their opponent in time trouble. Anyway, we start the activity here with the F5 push. He takes F5 and um, and I was kind of expecting this move, but that leaves this pawn backwards and isolated. And it looks pretty ugly. And in fact, uh, the computer confirms that uh, the way Petrosian took here with the G pawn is the better move. And uh, the king, it may look like the king is a bit less safe here because of uh, the open file here, but there's a lot of pieces. The rooks are already on the second rank and, uh, and it's more important to keep the pawns together in the center and uh, maybe even this pawn can be used to shut out uh, the bishop on this diagonal. Um, so, so in fact, taking the other way would be a mistake. So this is the right way to take. Uh, Rook to d2 is played. And now uh, Petrosian decides to trade off the bishop. That goes with check. The Rook takes. And I think Kerez is happy with this. Maybe he's thinking he can push a pawn forward here and bring the Rook over, uh, get, get some attack going. But... Uh, Petrosian's rook gets there first. <laughs> so um, king to h1, stepping out of any pins along the g-file. Rook to g6. So opening up some lines here. Maybe the rook can come over here. Maybe the queen can come here. We'll see what happens. Rook back to d2, defending along the second rank. Rook to d8. Making sure this pawn is defended. Uh, it was defended by the queen already, but uh, well, now the queen is free to move with the rook over here. Actually, not the queen is not free to move. The queen has to hold on to that rook too. <laughs> okay, uh, next move, rook e to d1. Okay, so maybe he's playing that in anticipation of uh, white doubling the rooks there. Uh, rook to d7, so still securely defending the d-pawn. Queen back to f2. Queen to d8. Queen to e3, e5. So finally getting in that central push and f4. So f4 was played on move 39 and seems to be a bit of a mistake. So I guess both sides are probably in time trouble at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, Karez obviously wanted to try and uh, open things up, but it did, um, I mean, it opens things up against his king as well. So it is a bit of a loosening move. Um, and actually, uh, Petrosian's response, which was to push the e-pawn forward, seems to have been a mistake as well. So we have two slight mistakes from both players. So what could white do here? White could continue maneuvering with uh, bishop to d3. Maybe uh, kind, of, kind of enticing black to push that pawn forward, maybe wanting to provoke some exchanges there. Um, anyway, uh, and after f4, Black, instead of pushing the pawn forward, could have directly brought the queen over to the h-file or, or moved the rook to the h-file. Both of those were suggestions from the chess engine, just starting to go directly for the king side attack there. So anyway, a couple of slight inaccuracies here. Knight to e2. And, uh, and so uh, all along, white has still maintained this slight edge. I don't want to give the impression that black has uh, somehow managed to convert this to a winning position. But, uh, but white, black is keeping the game going and building up pressure on the king. It's actually getting a little bit trickier for white to defend at this point. Um, let's see, rook d to g7, increasing that pressure, knight to d4, bringing the knight in back to that, uh, oh, oh, it's the d5 square it's usually sitting on. Well, the d4 square is good here, looking at the uh, f pawn there. Bishop back to d7, yeah, also hitting the bishop. So the bishop drops back to defend a3, maybe preparing to uh, push push that knight away. a3, queen to uh, a8. An interesting uh, diagonal move. Uh, looking at the uh, pawn this way, well, through his own pawn, so still not clear what's going on here. King to g1. King decides it's uh, Better to go back there, maybe be able to push the g-pawn forward at some point. h5. So just throwing pawns forward and rook to b1. 
Rook to b1 actually seems to be a slight mistake. So if we back up, um, the chess engine would play directly here with knight b5. Just trying to cash in with the pressure on, uh, on the pawn. And this would probably provoke the exchange. This is what the recommended line was. And then maybe queen back to f8, keeping, keeping the pawn defended. But uh, it is a target. And uh, well, with that bishop off the board, maybe that's one less piece that can participate in the attack. And it seems like uh, black is, uh, white. white is still doing fine here. Um, rook, to B8, rook to b1. Again, it uh, looks like white is thinking about pushing that b-pawn forward, which uh, does eventually happen, but it doesn't seem to be as, uh, as forcing or as relevant as the central play here. Um, and Petrosian continues pushing with the h-pawn. Rook b to b2, doubling. Oh no, sorry, the other way. Rook b to b2, doubling this way to defend along the second rank. Rook to g4. Maybe putting some pressure on this pawn, although it's defended. Uh, rook to f2. You know, bringing a second defender over anyway. Queen back to d8. So we saw some more of those queen maneuvers. The queen went to a8, and now it's come back to d8. And now b4. Karaz decides it's time to push on. And this was part of his plan, bringing the rook to the b-file, playing a3, now b4. But, uh, but Petrosian spots are really... Uh, clever move here. So once again, it's uh, it's all about trying to catch your opponent out and find those moments where you can you can spot an idea and take advantage of his play and the momentary positioning of his pieces. So if you want to think about this position for a while, see if you can spot a move here. Okay, uh, yeah, pause the video if you want time to think about it. It's certainly not an easy one. Uh, but I'm going to give the answer, the answer away now. Um, what you would like to do is uh, bring your knight forward, but uh, probably, I mean, that's a great square and it's forking the two rooks, but probably the uh, the bishop will just trade it off and you'll lose a pawn. So that's not something you can play right away, but that motivates this move, <laughs> rook, rook to g3. So imagine for a second that you can't take that rook. Uh, if the queen goes back, queen to c1, then you can play knight to g3. And uh, this looks pretty good for black. Although the chess engine thought uh, white could play this way and it's still an even game here. I guess uh, white has some pressure too. Although it does look to me like black is just picking up the exchange. Well, he's going to have to uh, solve the problem of this rick eventually. Uh, so maybe that's the, the counter pressure. <laughs> so that did not happen in the game. But uh, that's kind of the idea of this uh, sacrifice. Now, uh, Karez uh, said, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing giving me your uh, rook? And so we'll get to see what the idea, the other idea of the sacrifice is. So uh, black is down a whole rook here, but of course, uh, white's king position is looking really precarious. Now we are after the time control, so both have time. Both players have time to try and figure this out. Um, and Karez, after some thought, presumably played rook f to d2. And this looks like a, a clever maneuver. He's trying to uh, provide room for the bishop to come out. And uh, he didn't want the, the rook to be lost, locked in on that square. So that was his idea. Uh, and just try and hold on in this position, get the bishop out of the way, maybe even walk the king out. <clears throat> Although the bishop only has this square to go to, so it's going to be difficult to walk the king out of this position. So, uh, but th there are some other defensive ideas here as well. Um, oddly enough, the move the chess engine is suggesting here is rook to f3. <laughs> and uh, this also seems to lead to a position which is about even. Well, remember, white, uh, white is up a rook, right? Black sacrificed a rook, so he can give the rook back. <laughs> and uh, white takes, uh, uh, black takes, white takes. And it seems like white can defend this position, and this is rated as about even. But, uh, well, white would still have to suffer from the attack there and, and wouldn't have any material to show for it. So not understandable he uh, wouldn't go for it. And also, uh, well, queen h4 could have been tried here too. Bishop e2. 
and uh, but probably still eventually you're going to take that that rook because uh, at this point you're not you're not actually breaking through the defensive idea here. Your queen comes in, king steps aside, and then this queen has a way to come in and defend against the mate. So that's the defensive idea there. But this also seems to be about even. But the the rook back to d2. This this uh, trying to keep the material and defend at the same time seems to be a little bit too much for white. So queen h4 coming in for the attack. Bishop e2. Rick to h7, just doubling up on the h file. King f1. And now um, Carez was probably expecting queen here, for which he had prepared the move queen to g1. And uh, well, white is just winning in that position. But there is one key move here that he must have uh, overlooked in his calculation. So if you can spot the move here, find the winning move. Okay, pause the video if you want time to think about it. There's uh, only one move here that I see and uh, it's enough to force checkmate. So I'm going to give the answer away now. The move was queen takes f4 check. I mean, it was enough to force resignation. I think I think actually it is a maiden five at this point too. So, um, well, if the king runs away, you're going to grab the queen with check and then bring the rook in. So, yeah, probably probably not happening. Uh, probably not. That uh, probably is a mate. And uh, well, the key idea here is that if the queen takes and the rook comes in, and that's mate anyway, because these squares are blocked and the queen is no longer on this diagonal. And the queen has no other squares on the diagonal. Um, it, it could go here, I suppose, but then queen takes queen as mate. So queen takes f4 check, killer move. Nice finish to that game. Okay, I have one more example game I want to show you. The last game I want to show you on the uh, Meroxy bind is a game that was suggested to me by uh, Rod McNevin in uh, one of the comments. So Rod is someone who's uh, made a lot of comments on my videos over the years and they're often uh, very thoughtful and much appreciated. So this game was played uh, in the USSR Championship in 1957 with the white pieces we have Simeon Furman and with the black pieces Boris Spassky. And Spassky has a very unusual approach to uh, dealing with the Meroxy bind. So let's see how we get there first. Um, Furman starts with knight f3, Spassky plays c5, Furman plays c4, and uh, Spassky plays g6. Um, it's a pretty normal setup. It starts to look uh, like an accelerated, uh, not a symmetrical English, not like an accelerated dragon. It looks like an asymmetrical English at this point. And I suppose it would have kind of stayed in English lines if uh, Spassky had played knight f6, but he played uh, g6 which is uh, also a common move here, pairing to Fianchetto the bishop, frequently played in the English, but it does give white the chance to play e4 here. And so we've actually transposed or will transpose in a couple of moves, bishop g7, d4. Um, and now this is a Sicilian. We get this exchange and knight c6, and this is a position from the accelerated dragon. We might have seen this in the, in the previous video, in fact. Um, and white continues with bishop e3 and um, Black goes knight f6, white goes knight c3. I'm pretty sure that is the position we reached in the previous video. But uh, Spassky did not play that way. He did not play the normal knight f6 move. Instead, he played knight to h6. So this is a very unusual continuation, but uh, well, it's something to think of if you like um, these tactical kinds of positions where you have more of a open center. So your idea here is uh, you're gonna play a quick f5 and try and bust up the center. This is a risky strategy though, because you're weakening your king position quite a lot early on. It's, it's pretty committal, but uh, you can try it out and see if it works for you. Pretty interesting way to play. Knight to c3, castles, so normal development, bishop e2, and now uh, f5. So Spassky waited until he castled, but then pushed uh, f5 at the first opportunity after castling. So white took here, there's no, um, there's no pushing that pawn forward. I suppose white could play some other move and wait for black to take, but um, well, Furman chose to take here. And now uh, uh, Spassky played the second move here that was interesting to me. I think this just uh, takes a little bit of uh, foresight, maybe seeing the kind of position that might arise. I mean, if I was gonna exchange here, I would probably take with the knight. This would be my kind of instinctual um, 
way to play because you normally want to keep this bishop. It's a strong piece and if you do give it up you, you normally want to give it up for your opponent's bishop of the same color. Um, actually I think uh, in this position the chess engine was recommending take here and then white would take. So um, so you may have lost the, the bishop but at least uh, black doesn't have a, a dark squared bishop to take advantage of those squares. But if you look at this position a little deeper it seems that somehow black has fallen behind here. These, these pawns are looking kind of backwards. This bishop is still trapped. Uh, white's ready to castle. Um, so this uh, turns out to be a good position for white. So that would be the wrong way to take there. Um, and so it's interesting that uh, Spassky chose to give up this bishop right away. That's what I said. That's what I think is counterintuitive about this. And, uh, and after the bishop takes back he doesn't keep trading. He allows uh, white to keep the bishop pair and to keep that uh, black bishop but he has another way of dealing with it. He takes here with the knight. So I think this is what is good about uh, black strategy here. Now this bishop is just hanging here. If it goes back then uh, black can exchange it off and create some pawn damage. So that's probably worth doing. Also opening up the f-file. Uh, so the bishop goes to c5. So maybe this is what Spassky saw when he was playing this way or maybe he figured it out in advance. Anyway pretty interesting line of play. This bishop is now a bit awkwardly placed and now he can kick it with d6. Bishop drops back to a3 and he plays knight f to uh, d4. So he gets a knight on this uh, nice looking d4 square and that also opened up this line for his uh, rook. So white castles here. White gets castled in this game so it's not uh, like the Fisher game where uh, white was prevented from castling but uh, still you can see that black has attacking ideas towards the king. Um, Furman continues with bishop to oh whose turn is it? Uh, yeah white castled. So Spassky continues with bishop to f5. Nice location for the bishop. Furman goes rook c1 so normal development. Queen to d7. So making a battery with the queen and the bishop. And it's interesting that this knight is kind of just hanging here for a bit but it is supported by its uh, counterpart. So normally when you see a, a knight in the center it's supported by a pawn. I think we'll evolve to that kind of structure here in a bit. So knight to d5 we get this typical position of this Meroxy knight. Uh, rook to f7 was played. Preparing to double on the f-file. Also maybe defending that pawn. Maybe not. That's, that's pretty well defended. I think it's mostly about doubling. Uh, b3 typical Meroxy move and uh, gives a square for the bishop to come back to. So this looks like a really good diagonal for the light squared bishop. Rick a to f8. Yeah so it was all about the doubling there. Bishop to b2. And now there is a bit of pressure on the knight. So uh, e5. And uh, now b4. Yeah, b4 seems like an interesting move. It uh, looks pretty natural. You want to attack that knight and uh, maybe you can exchange this knight off after this one has gone away. So looks like a very uh, straightforward way to play and um, but it seems to be a slight mistake. So the chess engine is actually recommending f3 here. It's maybe noticing already that there's some weaknesses along the f-file and it wants to try and shore that up in advance. So b4 a slight mistake. Um, the bishop drops back to e6. So not, not worried about the pawn push to uh, b5. Well for one thing this knight can always escape by, um, by taking this bishop with check. So it's not, not really a big deal at the moment. Um, in this position white plays bishop to d3. So maybe this does start to set up that uh, b5 push as a threat. But uh, things are just moving too fast for white to ever get that in. Now this is a point where Spassky really starts to take over the game. Plays the move bishop to g4. <laughs> and uh, well it's defended. It's not a sacrifice. But it's a very forcing move. The queen does not have a lot of good squares. Uh, first of all if the queen runs away uh, you know the, the knight's covering these squares so maybe you could run out here. Then um, 
bishop to f3 is a winning move. It's the attack with the white's pieces all over on the queen side or in the center. Um, it's just no good. Uh, if the bishop is taken, then the knight can come in here with check, and then the queen can come in with check, and it's pretty much all over. And if the bishop isn't taken, the queen is coming in anyway, so uh, that's just not working. Let's go back. Uh, so that was if the queen runs away. Uh, the queen could try to go to a different square, but the other squares are, for example, d2. These other squares are on dark squares, and this actually runs into a different problem with the, with the knight fork. It's basically the same kind of problem. It's just not enough uh, defense around the king here. So taking the knight results in... Uh, now the queen can come over and defend here, but uh, there's this really neat uh, deflection move here. So this wasn't played, but uh, this uh, may have been the idea here. There's this move, knight takes b4. And uh, the reason this knight is being deflected is because the rooks want to join in the game and the knight is controlling this square. And knight's just going to get traded off. So he might as well grab. I mean, that was a knight sacrifice. He might as well grab. There's nothing, nothing better. But then rook f4 is going to win the queen because there's this uh, threat of mate here. Um, best move here is queen g3 and rook g4. And it's, uh, well, it'll be a uh, rook and a knight for the queen, but uh, it's still winning for black. So that's those are some of the ideas in this position after bishop g4. So uh, Furman played f3, which turns out to be the best defense, but it's just not good enough. So Spassky sacrifices here anyway and takes with the knight. There's a check. King runs to uh, h1. Queen comes out to h3, threatening mate here. And now here is the uh, last chance. Uh, this is still winning for black, but there is a move here, queen e2 that defends and uh but what's funny is the reply here knight takes h2 this is actually pretty good uh if the queen takes well probably the queen should take and, um the queen was defending that bishop so um spassky gets the bishop and uh, he doesn't sacrifice uh i guess he's still down one piece because he sacrificed a piece but um but the king is all exposed and black he has a good attack here. So um, white, black is still winning in this position, but it's going to be a longer game. It's not an immediate uh, breakthrough. Anyway, uh, instead of defending with the queen, Furman defended with the rook. And so there's one more move in the game that forced a uh, resignation. So if you want to uh, <laughs> think about this position for a while, can you see what uh, Spassky played in this position? Okay, yeah, pause the video here if you want some time to think about it. I'm giving the answer away now. Spassky played knight to e1. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is just game over. The threat is uh, rook takes rook with uh, mate on h2. The knight is preventing the queen from coming over and defending the h2 square. And even queen takes knight trying to defend the rook doesn't work because... Uh, Black has two rooks, and there's no other piece that can come in and defend there. So there's actually uh, just no defense at this point. Just uh, throwing that rook down on, I mean, throwing the knight down on the back rank, blocking out the queen's view of the uh, g1 square, and uh, and it's all over. <laughs> so anyway, that was a, a nice game. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and hope you enjoyed this series. Hey, let me do a brief recap. So. For black, when you want to play against the Meroxy bind, there's a couple of different strategies you can employ. One is to try and avoid it, and then um, if black insists, or if white insists, uh, after you've played the moves that usually avoid it, uh, generally you, you get an equal position by just playing directly against it in the center with moves like e6 and d5, busting it up like that. Um, alternatively, if you don't mind playing against it, if you're interested in trying out these maneuvering games, you can go for an accelerated dragon, just play right into the Meroxy bind. You have a fine position and you can wait for your opponent to uh, push too hard, make a mistake, and then counterattack. 
So that's a strategy that appeals to many players. And then uh, lastly, as we saw uh, uh, Boris play here, sometimes you can even go into a Meroxy bind giving white all of the advantages and still get some kind of uh, direct attack against it with uh, that F5 push at the right time. So um, anyway, I hope you found these selections of games uh, interesting and learned something about the Meroxy bind. And I'm going to be back with my uh, next middle game idea. It's going to be the exchange, sac the exchange sacrifice. I hope you guys will stay tuned for that and I will see you then. Bye.